So last class, and um, and so we're just going to keep going over plant ID, what's out there right now, what it looks like when it's all grown up, and what um, what things are useful for and how they can help us. Okay, so um, I did bring us a salad with a lot of the. Um, herbs we've been talking about and plants we've been talking about through our previous classes. So um, I want to have enough time at the end here for you guys to sample it if you want to. And see, I left things kind of whole so you could do the tasting thing and see if you can guess what they are and identify them that way. So we'll do that at the end. Um, I, I, do, I did bring the pictures. Some of the pictures, if you want to look at them close up while I'm toggling back and forth, you can maybe share these, share these down a little bit. Um, not all the plants are in here, so uh, we'll just see what we can do. Um, all right, so let's start. So some of these things I have pictures of like from the other PowerPoints we'll go back and forth between and some of them are just brand new that we I went out and took some pictures this morning so right now we're going to look at what is growing in the woods right this minute so if you're out there looking around these are the things that you might want to start keeping an eye out for and and marking so let's start with This is a bunchberry, and bunchberries grow low to the ground in patches. I'm gonna, let's see, like this. And so if you go out in the shady woods right now, kind of the same kind of woods that you were looking for fiddleheads and leeks in, you're gonna see these little patches with these little white flowers all over the place that they're growing there. And when they get to their ripeness, they look like this. So that little white flower in the middle turns into a little bunch of orange berries, so bunch berries. These are kind of a, more of a staple survival food. They're not necessarily something you're gonna go out and pick buckets of because they're so tasty to eat. They're really high in pectin, um, and so they're used in as a filler for pies and puddings and things like that. The Native Americans would, um, and early pioneers would gather a lot of them and dry them. They dry well, um, and so and they get more sweet when they're dried, like a lot of fruits do. So some people like to just get them and dry them and then you can throw them into you know your cereal or whatever it is that you your trail mix and things like that and you can get some of the benefits um, from from that way you can eat them raw and fresh they're sort of bland they're sort of mealy or woody almost kind of uh, sort of like a soft uh, choke cherry, crab apple kind of texture. So, you know, but they're easy to identify, fun to pick, and if you're out there just kind of monking around and you get a little hungry, there's a, there's a choice for you. So, all right, then we're gonna, let's see, close that one. And we're gonna take a look at, also what's going on right now in the woods is, Thimbleberries. Have you seen these? They grow in the shade. They're kind of tall. I've got a close up here somewhere. Uh, let's go this way. There's a close up of the flower. You can see that leaf has kind of a, almost like a maple leaf shape to it. It's, um, it's a prunus variety, so it's actually like a cousin of, of raspberries. So raspberries kind of have this same shaped leaf. They grow really near where the raspberries grow oftentimes. And these berries 
turn into, let's see, cross that off. This is what they look like. So this is actually a bunch that, this one in the middle here, that's the ripe berry. This one's coming along, and then this one is maybe um, a little bit further behind that. They're very, very, see how it kind of sort of almost looks like a raspberry too? But when you go to pick them, they come off inside of where that red part is, is like a little white cone. It's a hard little center, and that red part of the berry just slips right off of there, and it's kind of hollow, and, and it looks like a thimble. So kids will stick them on their fingers and walk around and go like that and things like that, kids and kids of all ages. Um, they're very, very soft. So if you're going to gather them, you just have to be really gentle with them or know that by the time you get home, you want to put them in a container that is going to catch the juice because it's going to end up turning into something more like a sauce by the time you get home. They're tasty. They taste kind of, I don't know, Suze, what do you think they taste like? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. A little more sweet than a raspberry. More close, like more like a strawberry almost flavor. So tasty to, to find a pick. If you see a um, a patch of them, I mean they're they're tall right now and they're flowering all over the place. And you'll get you can pick plenty. And a lot of people will make jam and things like that out of out of them. They make, that's a good consistency kind of thing that they, they make. And what's left here? Um, okay, so I wanted to show you just how closely they look like a, oop, that's not the right picture. Oops, somebody got mis mislabeled. Raspberry leaves. I'm sure you've all seen wild raspberries before. Um, now is a good time to pick the leaves and start drying them for winter teas and things. You can also uh, make tea fresh out of them. Um, you take a close look at the canes because raspberries are biennial. So the canes that are going to uh, make the fruit this year are the ones that, that are going to have the flowers and they look different than the ones that just are a stalk of leaves. So, and, and it's pretty easy to tell. They, the, the ones that are going to have the fruit on them, the leaves bunch up a little bit differently on the cane and you want to take the leaves that aren't going to, take the canes that aren't going to make the berries this year, right? They're really easy um, to harvest to dry. These are a good, um, good plant to cut the whole cane and hang it to dry. So you um, find a, a place where you can hang them up and dry them, and then when they get all dried up on the stem, you take your, do this with your gloves on because they're pokey, and then you just go strip them right off the stem, and and you're done. So it's a really easy way to, to preserve them for in the winter time. Raspberry leaf is loaded with minerals. It's super nutritious. It's, it's, um, it's got all kinds of nutrition for supporting like our digestive system, our lymphatic system, um, our immune system. It helps to balance fluids in the body. It's mildly astringing. And so it helps to, if people have too much water um, in their GI tract or something like that, it will help to tonify that up and tighten things up. So it's useful in the summertime as a cold drink because it's like lemonade, you know, it, it helps to um, keep us um, from over sweating. People are really, um, really heavy sweaters and they're losing a lot of their fluids that way and like in, in, in an excess way, then the um, raspberry 
is a good um, cold tea to drink. And you just make that right with the fresh leaves and you can, it's really easy to make as a sun tea. Um, and it's, it's real mild tasting and, 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 and really good for you. So let's see, who else is growing out there right now? This is Ella Campaign. We'll talk about Ella Campaign. This is what it looks like when it's grown up. It's very tall. Those leaves, can you see the size of those leaves? They're big. So the picture of the close-up of the leaves, which is how they look right now, those leaves are like this big. Mm -hmm. And they will get bigger. So it's easy to spot, and it grows oftentimes like along the edges of an old field. Um, where the ground is a little bit more dry and rocky. And what we do with this is we use the root. We, so we use the root. The root is very warming. It's diffusive. Um, it's astringent as well. It moves fluid. So when someone has a really deep uh, congested lung that is stuck and it won't move, and it's, and it's deeper in the lung and goopy. This is where we use elecampane. It's kind of got a musty, um, pungent smell to it. And it really um, breaks up fluids and stuckness warms up the tissues and gets things moving. So it's a really useful one for um, making sure you have something for those kinds of winter colds and flus. It's a little bit hard to dig because it does grow kind of hard dirt. Um, and it's another one of those plants, kind of like burdock, where it'll have like these big, huge, giant roots in the middle. And then a lot of other smaller roots off to the sides. And those are the ones you want to go for. And, and this is another plant where if you're digging up the roots, you want to chop them up as soon as possible because they do get very hard and then they're really hard to um to chop up here's a close-up of an ella campaign that's how big the leaf is that's my hand maybe it's because i'm tapping it twice so jewelweed grows in the shade and it is growing right now it's very pretty short here's a close-up jewelweed is important to know because it is a specialist in mitigating poison ivy. And jewelweed grows um, near where poison ivy grows. So you see the picture in your, in your hand out there? I brought one of the bigger ones. And jewelweed is a very sensitive plant. It didn't, I had picked this like right before I left and stuck it straight into the water and it's still, it's not liking me. So what I want you to see is how this works. Get rid of this root here. Inside of here is this like really gooey jelly-like substance. So if you squish it and squeeze it out, you can feel it. It's very slippery. And that's where the medicine is. You can see that? Just kind of even just peel the stem apart and really squeeze it. When they get bigger, I mean, the stem will be like as big around as my finger. And then there's a lot, a lot of juice in there. And so um, it's going to get about two to five feet tall, depending on where it's growing and how shady it is. It grows really, it really likes the shady wet. And the, the roots are very shallow. So like you go to pull it up and it just, it pops right out. Um, it um, has those little orange kind of goldfish shaped flowers. It's a, it's a cousin of a snapdragon. Um, it's a very, like, you know, you can't really drive this one. If you dry it, all of the juice and gel goes out of it, and that's the property. So this is the one that you want to gather up and get some in the freezer. 
or preserve it into um, some other sort of liquid right away, like right when you go to use it. Um, this is a good one where if you, if you don't have enough room for like the fresh plant in your freezer, but it's a good idea to keep a bag in your freezer. Um, make the tea out of it right away. And do you remember how we talked about you could freeze things in cupcake tins? So that you make an infusion and you freeze it in the, in the cupcake tin or in an ice cube tray. And then you just throw those in the bag once they're frozen and you can pull one out. And a cupcake tin is about a half a cup of liquid or four ice cubes is about a half a cup of liquid. And the reason to do this or keep some um, volume of it in your freezer, because if somebody does get the poison ivy, um, so there's a chemical in there, it's called losone, that actually stops the, um, what's the stuff in the poison ivy called? Um, it's called urushiol, U-R-U, S H I O L. That's the that's the, the the chemical in the poison ivy that makes it spread and itch, and and so it stops that process from happening. And you want to chop up a bunch of the plant and like be compressing with it, poulticing with it, and it's it's very soothing, and it works really well. This can also be used for things like spider bites. Um, uh, mosquito bites. One year, we had some family come from um, Okinawa, and the, my daughter-in-law at the time, she did not speak very good English back then, and she was having, and she's super shy, so she was having a really hard time being, being here with, and it was like one of the first nights they had come over to visit us, and we're sitting out in the yard, and the bugs were pretty bad, but nobody was really noticing, you know? And it turned out that her, like the next morning, her feet were so bitten up that they were swollen. I mean, she could hardly walk on them. They were so bad, but she didn't know how to say anything and she didn't know what to do. So, jewel weed to the rescue. We just made this whole big gloppy pile of it, stuck her foot in like a soaking pan and she soaked her feet and we covered them up and um, we did that, you know, we switched it out probably every half an hour for the first, probably a couple of hours she sat there with her feet in there and the swelling started to go down, the itching stopped and she was able to like get her shoes on so, you know, she wasn't completely miserable and then we just, um, kept it intermittently up throughout until her feet, you know, cleared up all the way. So that was, that was a really good um, case study. <laughs> so for her to, to bring that. Um, some people will take and make this like into glycerin soaps and things like that. I think there's some mixed reviews on how well the properties will stay into the soap, but Heck, it's worth, you know, worth a try if, if you have that opportunity. So very, very good one to, to get to know. All right, let's just see what happens if I do this. Okay, so this is goldenrod. We've talked a little bit about goldenrod. I do have a picture of goldenrod in here. all grown up. You've seen this on the sides of the yard and there's there's a bunch of different um, species of goldenrod. Some of it grows in the woods. It's a little bit different leaf shape. Um, but right now it's about this tall. So this is what you're looking for when you're out looking, looking around the edges of the yard and things like that. Again, I tried to pick this one so you could see what it looks like about how tall it is. And 
clearly it wasn't very happy to be yanked <laughs> out of the ground. So um, you can eat these leaves. They're sweet on the front end and then they get a little bitter. They didn't put this in our salad. That's why I brought it on its deathbed to show you. Um, this is a good time to pick this for making medicine. Um, we use the leaves um, mostly. People do use the flower tops um, for making different kinds of teas and things too. They're a little bit sweeter than the leaves. Um, but this is astringing, okay, and it's, um, it's got, it helps to move blood, so it's um, good for sore muscles. That's why it's um, in the PowerPoint for musculoskeletal. So it moves blood. So it's in, if you couldn't use Arnica because the wound was open, Golden Seal is a choice, which also it pairs really well with Yarrow, which also is moving the blood and helping to heal wounds. Um, I use this mostly for that purpose if I'm using it topically, but internally it's like my one of my go-tos for sneezy, runny, drippy. It's specific for um, cat allergies. And usually people that are allergic to cats, it seems, sometimes are also allergic to like rabbits and horses. So it's a, not, it, not always, but sometimes. And that if someone is having that kind of response, this is a good one to try in those situations as well. So, so you would, would you dry it, do it as a tea or? You can do that or you can make it into a tincture or a glycerite. Um, so, and if you're tincturing it, do it fresh. Glycerite too. Um, if you're gonna make it topical, you might wanna dry it first before you put in the oil. Do you remember talking about how fresh herbs have a lot of water in them? And that if you don't get the water out of your oil, um, it'll go off um, quickly for you. So, um, Put infusing fresh herbs into oil is a great remedy. It's, they're really um, beautiful. You just have to, to take a little more care with it and, and time. So um, it's, a, it's a nice mild tasting tea. You know, so it, you can add it to things if you need to balance something out too for people. So you can add it to um, a mint blend, but you want it to maybe be a little tiny bit more tonifying and then you can put the golden rod in there, that sort of thing. So it's not just for allergy related, sneezy, runny, drippy, it will also work for um, colds and things like that too that have those symptoms. So, all right, let's see who's next. Talked about that enough. Okay, so this is chamomile, this is a close up. So right now the chamomile is about, mm, this is probably about 10 inches tall. And so there it is from a little bit of a distance. You can see next to it there is the Monarda fistulosa that we were talking about. So right now, and I think too, it's so been so dry. Things are a little bit stunted still. Because like this Monarda, again is maybe 10 inches tall. Normally this time of year it would probably be at least half again as tall as that. So when you're out looking for things kind of keep that in mind um, as you get to know what's growing at what time of the season. It's like you know it's super weather dependent um, and you know you, like this year everything's a little bit shorter. So I would um, still look for um, both of these plants in more of those drier, more open field areas. And um, think about, they, they make a great pair. That's probably why they're growing next to each other. But chamomile is one of our most gentle and broad spectrum nervines. 
so good for babies, good for elders, good for um, calming down the nervous system. Uh, Matthew Wood says chamomile is for babies of all ages, and so it can kind of take that uh, whininess out of a person's experience. Um, it's used as a digestive herb because it's got some calming down abilities to the stomach and helps to settle the stomach down if it's um, herpy or um, gassy or having some reflux issues. The monarda is antiviral, it's antifungal, it's used um, for any imbalance that has any sort of founding in those areas, so lung conditions, um, UTI, bladder infection, um, any kind of infection that's superficial, like a wound that needs to be cleaned up. Those, this, um, um, Menard is a, a specific for burns. And if you remember tasting it um, the last class, that it was um, kind of oily, kind of had some heat to it, which is one of the signatures for um, how it helps us with those kinds of conditions of that hot, dry skin condition or hot, dry, uh, uh, wet, needing to balance the, dry, the, the heat and the fluids in like the urinary tract. Um, I think that's, that's all we'll say about that one. So we've talked a lot about calendula, and calendula is this beautiful bright orange flower that is um, specific to lymphatics. You got a picture, I think, of calendula in your pile. Um, this is one that you want to just plant in your garden. It's a self-seeding annual, so every year it's going to reseed itself and a new, a new plant will grow. You can also save some of the seeds and like intentionally plant them where you want them to spread. And we use calendula a lot for antibacterial properties to help it, um, to help with different kinds of um, infections, either internally or topically a great skin remedy. It's, it's a warming lymphatic, we call it. And so um, it's helping uh, fluids to move that are kind of stuck and cold. And the signature for that is that it's a really resinous flower. Like you're picking it and um, your fingers get really sticky with the resin that's growing on the um, flower buds. And so that's kind of the, tells us that it's going to help with that sticky, um, hot fluid in our bodies. So good for pussy wounds, good for mouth um, infections, um, good for uh, stomach issues that have that sticky stuckness. We want to kind of move and warm up. Um, people that have like chronic low grade like immunity problems and things like that can often benefit from just adding calendula into their tea blend. So um, right now, calendula looks very tiny. So this is the calendula. And so they're about this big. But you have plenty of time to get some seeds and get them in, even in a pot. It, they, it grows really well in a pot, and then you will, you know, can make sure that you have some of that for this winter. And also you can, once, once you are done harvesting the flowers and the plant is done producing for the season, you can also take the greens and dry the greens or freeze them and use them in soups and stews and things like that in the winter. That those properties are also in the leaves, and um, that's one of the reasons it has its nickname Pot Marigold, because they would put that into the pot. So would you freeze it or dry it? Either. Or either way? 
Yep, either way. And remember, all these things, you know, always think, okay, would this be one that I want to put into vinegar? You know, would this be one I want to infuse my salad dressing with? Okay, back to the bunch berries. So I think maybe we got all <laughs> caught up from the beginning. So let's go down here to the bottom. We'll go work our way up backwards. So this is a dock plant. This is yellow dock. I couldn't get a very good picture of this because of the lighting in the yard and that. I tried a couple different times a day, but it just was being persnickety. So we do have some of the baby um, dock leaves, not from this plant, from a different one, in the salad, and I left them kind of whole in case you wanted to pick them out because they can be a little bit bitter. And the baby leaves are usually, um, you know, much, much more of a salad herb than, than um, people would think. Once they get bigger and like these bigger leaves, you wouldn't want to put those just raw into a salad, but you can saute them like a collard green or something like that. And then it, they turn a little bit more sweet and they're very palatable that way. So you can use it as a side green. Um, so that's the way we use the, the tops. The root is the part of the plant that we use um, for medicine. And I don't have a picture of that, but it gets its name because it really has a yellow root. I mean, when you pull it up and you wash it off and you start chopping up the inside, it's, it's got a lot of yellow color to it. And if you have that sitting right next to like dandelion root drying, it's a very high contrast. And that yellow is, um, again, when plants have yellow in them, it's called a berberine, and that helps to stimulate the digestive tract. Berberines um, help with the gallbladder and the liver in digesting fats and oils. And so yellow dock root is something that goes into a lot of tea blends for people when they're working on trying to detox their liver or help their metabolism work better. Um, it's paired often with burdock, which we've seen pictures of. Um, and you have a picture in your packet there. I won't try and pull it up right this second. But um, because the burdock is a little bit more mild and gentle, and then the yellow dock kind of gives it a little bit more of a hit. And those are two things that go well together with also dandelion root. Those three together, go ahead, Susan. What was the term for berberine? Berberine. Berberine. B, yeah, B E R. Ber B. E R I N E. Yeah. Um, all dock plants are, um, they're part of the mustard family. So can you see how this kind of has a look of kind of like mustard greens? Um, yellow dock is probably the one with the most high amounts of the berberine in it for that digestive system, but there's many other kinds of docks. There's curly dock, there's giant dock, um, burdock. Um, they all have varying degrees of the ability to help with the digestive system. And if I know that I'm working with somebody that's really reactive, I might not put the yellow dock in their blend. I might put just the regular giant dock root in their blend because it's milder and it's going to be gentler on their system. And so taste-wise, um, you're going to find some variety, but um, you know, pick, pick some of all of them. We've got come on. Nope. Okay. And we've talked an awful lot about mullen. And you have a picture, a pretty good, decent picture of mullen there. I'll pull up the big one here. There's a grown up mullen. This is another um, herb that stimulates the, the, uh, the lymphatic system. 
It helps um, with balancing fluids, especially in the synovial tracts, which are the along like tendons and ligaments around discs and bursas and, and jointy things. Um, it helps to decrease edema because it's a lymphatic. It's um, not as warming as calendula. It's a little bit more drying. Um, it soothes irritated membranes. And right now the mullen is still pretty small. Ugh. Cannot get this thing to do what I want it to do. All right, this is valerian. We'll come back to that. Let's see if we can find the mullen. There it is. Um, this is a second year plant. You can see how it's starting to grow up in the middle. Okay, so this one you're going to want to let to grow. And then you're going to um, want to wait until it gets all the way grown up before you're taking the leaves off the stalk um, or using the flowers. We use the flowers um, to help with um, ear infections. The little tiny yellow flowers at the top, all, each one of those little yellow flowers looks exactly like a little tiny ear inside your ear. So if you look close, um, the next time you're next to Mullen, yeah, you will be able to um, see that. And it's used, um, a lot of the times they blend it with um, garlic in, an, in a little infused oil, and then that's used as a, a ear drop for uh, ear infections. All right, let's go back to the valerian. So this is growing all over the place right now and kind of the edges of the shade. Um, when this gets a flower stalk on it and it blooms, it's kind of purpley, purpley white, um, little umbel of little tiny flowers. It's a very pungent smell. Lots of people do not like the smell of this um, plant when it's growing. I see a head shaking back there. Um, it's real um, like cloying almost in smell. And, and actually that smell is kind of a signature for things that um, are more often used as a nervine. That, that kind of pungent cloying smell um, is in different um, herbs that really impact, like have a sedating effect on the nervous system. Like hops, for instance, has a real pungent smell to it when it's not in beer. <laughs> um, and the valerian does as well. The part of the plant that's used is the root. And so you wanna dig the root up either before it starts getting really big like this, or at the end of the season, when the plants have done flowering and it's starting to die back and the energy is going back down into the root. Th that's the same for any, any plant you're gonna use the root for. Um, and then you dig up the root and the roots, this plant is really big and bushy and tall. But then when you go to pull it up, it's got these little tiny, like roots like this practically. They're, they're just little and small. Um, recommend that you just put this straight into a tincture right away, or if you're going to dry it, um, which it doesn't taste very good as a tea. Most people are not going to want to drink valerian root tea. Um, but a tincture or a glyceride is nice. And it's a really, it's kind of actually more of a heavy hitter in terms of a sedative um, for the nervous system. Um, so you kind of have to use it with caution. You just take small doses. And this is not one that you take for a long extended period of time. Uh, it's more situational and your body can like acquire a tolerance to it. So this is one that if you take it for a while, you're gonna to have to take more and more and more to get the same effect. When it's drying, it smells like um, dirty gym socks that have been in the boys' bedroom for, 
for way too long and not found. <laughs> so if you're going to dry it, dry it in the garage or someplace like that because it really has a very, very powerful smell. So um, there is a caution with the valerian. So about 10% of the population react opposite to valerian. So instead of it being a sedative, it like amps them up. So people that like if they take Benadryl or an antihistamine that's supposed to make you drowsy and then they're like riding their bicycle around the living room in circles, that's, that's the same thing that can happen with those people with valerian. So that's a really good question to ask before you share this with somebody is, do you react to antihistamines that way? And then the other thing I always tell people to do is like, try this during the day first. Don't take it at night when you're like pulling your hair out because you can't go to sleep, you know, because you can take just like one or two drops and see what it's gonna do before you go ahead and take like five drops at night. So. That's the caution for that. We did that. This is marshmallow root. Again, not a super good picture. Right now, this is how tall marshmallow root is growing. We got a picture here. When it grows up big, it's going to have these beautiful little tiny, like mini hollyhock flowers on it because um, hollyhocks also a, a mallow plant there's all kinds of different mallows some of them are shorter kind of um, bushy with um, flowers that look a little bit like a wild rose um, those are, you can also use marshmallow root um, leaves are very fuzzy and soft and um, smoothing and they're very mucologenous. So we use, you can use all parts of the plant. So drying the um, leaves and the flowers to put into teas to make them more um, viscous, more mucologenous. So if in the winter time we're having dry, oh my God, the wood stove, like inside of my nose is going to, you know, start bleeding in any minute, or my throat has got that irritated, I've had a cough, I can't go, it won't go away. Those kinds of dry sorts of internal, you know, situations, then this is really nice to put into tea um, in that way. You can use it as an infusion, again, for like dry, hot skin conditions to soothe and smooth and, and help that tissue to heal and cool off. Um, the root is used in commerce. And so it's the, it's the root that we use the most for the medicine. And it's got more mucologenous properties than the green part and the flowers. So it's got a little bit more of that slamification factor, as Jim McDonald likes to say. So, um, you know, gather, gather all the parts. So. This also likes to grow where it's wet, kind of wet, shady. It, it does grow a little bit more in the sunshine, like right here, you know, it's sunny like this probably about half the day for this plant. So it can take some sun and it might be growing a little bit further out from the deeper shade of the woods that you're looking for. All right. Okay, this is lamb's quarter. See the little tag there? I wanted you to get an idea of the size of this because it was really hard to get a scale. And lamb's quarter is whoops, going to be growing in your gardens, in areas of the, um, the yard that have been disturbed that are looking for some ground cover. Um, so again, think about what was growing there before the lamb's quarters. Is this a safe place for me to pick these and eat these from? Um, if you weed your garden actively, then this is going to want to try and grow in between the plants if you don't mulch. Um, can you see the red stem on here? Nope, wrong way. 
not quite. This is going to get a more of a red stem to it as it gets a little bit bigger, and that's our signature for that it helps us with our blood. Lamb's quarter is super high in iron. It's, it's got um, 65 mil 64 milligrams of iron in one serving. So like a cup, that's a lot. You know, so it's way higher in iron than spinach. Um, it tastes like spinach, but it's sweeter than spinach. The leaves are thin and floppy. There's lamb's quarter in your, um, in your salad here today. Um, so th another nickname for this plant is called goosefoot. And this is a way that you can identify it. Can you see how it's shaped like the foot of a goose? Right there. So that's a good way to look for it. Um, so you can use the leaves all the way through their whole growing cycle. Um, when they get older, they get this kind of white powdery, uh, it looks like mildew coating on them, and that's actually not mildew. It's a protective thing that the plant does to keep the insects from eating it. It gives it a different texture. It doesn't really have flavor, but at that point is when people start to go, eh, I don't want to eat that anymore, if they have a texture thing. Um, and um, otherwise, you can eat them all the way along. When the leaves get bigger, again, this is one where sometimes steaming them is, is a nicer option for getting them into your body. They make flowers out of the seeds of certain strains of amaranth. They grow these like as a farm crop, bigger versions. And then they take the seeds and they make like flour and stuff. Sue, do you want to take some salad with you? Oh, I'm OK. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so like one of the first years I had, I bought a strain of amaranth that I was like, okay, I'm gonna make flour out of amaranth and I'm gonna, you know, bake with it or whatever. And I planted some in my garden and I literally, you know, I did, I let it grow and I took the seed heads and I put them in a bag and I dried them and shook them out. And I ended up after that season with about a quarter of a cup of seeds. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's not even gonna make a muffin, <laughs> you know, so. Um, what I did end up doing is like putting it on like my cereal and stuff like that. So that's another way that you can use the seeds without like having to plant a whole farm field to try and make some bread. And they're good. They're kind of, um, they're kind of nutty tasting when they're dried. Um, they're teeny like a poppy seed. So I mean, they're very, um, you know, it takes a while to get like even a whole little half pint jar. But if you, ca if you gather enough, then you can throw them in things. You can eat the seeds raw too. They have a component called saponins in them, which are kind of like soapy, um, latexy kind of property that it, it'd be pretty hard to eat over eat amaranth seeds, but um, you know, an excessive amount may make people sick. So, um, Let's see who else is here. Can we go back to that uh, Mullen picture that has the definition next to it? Yes, we can. If I can find it. Is it up here? Huh. Something happened to the PowerPoint. It, um, let's see if it's in this one. The other one I must have accidentally closed. Here, doesn't have the definition. Did you need the definition? Yeah, that's what I needed was the definition. Okay. Um, well, let's read from here. How about that? Can you want me to just read something and then you can write it down? Well, it said it stimulates the lymphatic sports. system. Yep. Or I can just copy off that one. Yeah. I know, but I closed out that PowerPoint by accident. 
So I'm to here. The lymphatic system moves fluids. Moves fluids. It, and it helps to balance the fluids. So it works in the lungs, the kidneys, the nerves, the spine. It's for soothing hot, irritated, dry conditions. Okay. All right. I think we're almost through. Let's see. Let's see. Do we need? Oh, I know what I wanted to show you. Maybe we didn't take a picture of it. Um, do you need a refresh on yarrow at all? You got that one? We know plantain? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what plantain's for? <laughs> Plantain is our herbal drying agent. So it's going to suck things out like mosquito venom, bee bites, pus from a wound. It's good for um, helping to astringe and tonify internal tissues. So we use it a lot of times for helping with um, gut health. Um, if you have an infection in your mouth, you can chew on the plantain leaves and it'll help to draw that infection out of, a, out of a tooth. And then you just chew on that for a while and suck on it and then spit it out. That one you wouldn't want to swallow. All right. Horsetail. Here's the two kinds of horsetail. Both are interchangeable. The one in the middle there? That's... That's the same as this one. Oh, it's just a different angle? Yeah, it's just a close-up. So you can see the joints. Can you see those joints? There's a ton of that in the yard. Uh-huh. And that is, that's a little um, signature that it's good for our joints because horsetail is really high in silica, and that's a building block for our cartilage and our other soft tissues. So if you pull that plant apart at that little joint, it's actually like, stretchy in there just like a just like a tendon or a ligament so it only gets a few inches tall, like, it, yeah and some places it'll grow maybe you know like this high but it's not ever my perennial box is full of that can i just let it go a little bit and choke on my perennials it will eventually try and win okay. that's their job <laughs> yeah but it pulls out easy and it, it'll it'll grow back um for you. So this is a great one to, you know, um, tincture fresh. This one I pair with goldenrod for those wet, drippy kinds of tissue conditions because it's tonifying, it's supportive, and it's part of the building block system. It's going to help the tissue get stronger so that it can do its work without getting out of balance. And what else? Well, I couldn't find any purslane. I looked for that. Keep your eyes out for this. This is so good. If we, if we could have this in our salads today. Chickweed amaranths. The yeah, am it's shiny. It's a succulent. Okay. Yep, for sure. So it's very juicy. Um, yeah, very tasty. Real high in um, omega-3s. So super good for you in that way. Um, vitamin A and high in pectin, which again, this is used um, oftentimes to thicken smoothies, um, thicken pestos. It's real sweet. It has like a cucumbery sort of flavor. Yeah, really yummy. Let's see, what else do we have here? We looked at the lamb's quarters. The nettle is, nettle is almost past picking right now for using leaves and things. You want to um, 
it's on its last, it's getting a little tall, so then you're going to want to wait then for the seeds in the fall. And I think, let's go back down this way here. We might have touched on everybody. I'm going to close this one. Any questions about any of the pictures um, or any of the plants uses that we talked about? Okay. So, you ready for some taste taste testing? So, I had to get the basswood leaves on the way down, and so they are not actually in the salad. And you can choose to put some in your salad if you want to or not. This is a branch that came off of the tree itself up here. If you look at this one, we're not going to eat this one. You can see how um, some of the leaves in there are, they've got a little something going on. Like we wouldn't want to eat those. Somebody's been cohabitating on the leaves there. Um, but there are still some on there that you could eat. Now, can you see how they're not shiny anymore? So they're still edible at this stage. They're just um, getting a little bit tough. What is this one? That's a basswood leaf. Okay. And so these are the ones that were growing along the, um, the smaller little uh, shoots that were coming up from the little trees that the, the seeds had dropped. And can you see how these are still shiny? And so I'm not going to pass these around because in case you want to have some in your food, um, these are the ones that you want to get to eat. These are yummy. So yes, you can eat those ones. If you ate some of that leaf and then tasted this, you'd be like, oh, yeah, well, and this is the one we want. So in, and these you can still find, especially if you've got a tree that has, um, you know, a lot of little shoots going around the bottom. So you can still get some of these little tasty leaves before they're all too big to really enjoy. And then on the flip side of that is basswood leaves get kind of large, you know, by the time they're done growing. And you can use them like instead of a grape leaf for like domatis, or domas. So, and it's just another, like if you don't have access to a grapevine, um, another way that you can use those leaves once they get, you know, bigger than this. And they're a little bit um, tougher when they get older, and so they will roll up nicely like a grape leaf. It's another way you can put them into your diet. So, in here, you guys can come up and. What is the property that's in grape leaves that when you tan pickles keeps the crunch? It's the tannins. Mm -hmm. So you can do the same thing with a bay leaf. Yeah, I mean, it's, I've used bay leaf before, but uh, for some reason, it's not just us, but since the year before COVID, uh -huh. no one was putting more intensity grape leaves for sale. Oh, 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 oh. We, yeah, right. we, okay. we got them on our farm, but uh -huh. and no one in town had them for sale. And we okay. usually have them. I have grapevines if you want some leaves when it comes to that time of. You know, and also that reminds me. I have some St. John's wort that's probably going to need a move. Oh, yeah. And I know you were talking about trying to get it started and that you've been having trouble with doing it with seed. So I wanted to say. I was coming to plant last year. Okay. It's and a good size one, too, the, the St. John's wort. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you want to, yeah, to have a conversation about that, just let me know. All right. So in here, we have dandelions, goosefoot. We have some wood sorrel, which I don't know that we talked about that one that much, but it's, it's got a, um, people mistake it for a clover. So that's the one that looks like maybe like a clover leaf, but it's not. And we have um, the dock leaves. We have, what am I forgetting? Violet leaves. You can put your um, basswood in there if you want. We've got some um, garlic mustard flowers and a few little leaves. We've got some chive tops. We've got some dandelion um, petals. 
Remember, if we want to use the, the flower of the dandelion, we want to take that green part off so it stays sweet. Um, I think that might be it. So that's all just from, it's free salad. <laughs> so if you want to come on up and grab, oh, and then this is, um, do you remember when we were talking about onion honey? So this is the onion honey that we sampled whenever that class was. But then I added a little bit of uh, infused vinegar. So the vinegar was infused with um, sweet annie, which is an artemisia, it's an antiviral, it's just good for you. So, um, so it's those things, it's the vinegar, um, the onion, the honey, and then the infusion of the, the plant of artemisia in here. So, so it's not super tangy and you can help yourselves. Okay, what all was in there? Dandelion? Dandelion? Well, come, do you wanna, are you going to get some? So then you can pick yeah, through it and look. I just okay, know. dandelions, violet leaves. Lilac? Violet? Oh, violet. Um, let's see. What do we say? Wood sorrel. Um, dock leaves, yellow dock leaves. And then the lamb's quarter or the goose foot. Is that five things? What they? I think that's it. We'll take a peek while we're eating it and see. Dig around. <laughs> the onion honey? Yep. What, was, what did you add to it? Uh, just an infused vinaigrette. So, or, so it was just raw apple cider vinegar and then the plant that was in it um, was called Sweet Annie. It's, a, it's Artemisia annua. And that's just because that was on my counter when I was getting <laughs> ready for class and because that we've been using it up and that's what you got in your dressing. <laughs> Chickweed's a thickener. The um, purslane, very much a thickener. Um, the basswood has a tiny bit of mucolage in it. You could always put plantain in there. It's not super mucolaginous, but it has some property. Say um, Plantain. Yeah. Um, what was the other one that you said was thickener? The um, purslane. Um, what else is it? Oh, the um, marshmallow. Um, yeah, so you got a bunch of different options, really. There was a um, research study, and I'm not going to be able to say the name of it, that was done, I think, in Canada um, at a long-term care facility. One of the psychologists that I used to work with um, in the hospital did a presentation, and she quoted this research, and I thought it was really cool. that um, So they used chicken cartilage, like powder. You can buy it you know, in a powder, and it's put it in stuff, um, and they had a test group that they would have the chicken cartilage <coughs> in their orange juice, and the other group did not. And then they ran them through all these um, testing, like cognitive testing, balance testing, um, asked them how you know, vital they felt, and you know, all the different areas of living and well-being. After I don't know how, maybe three months or so, a time had passed. They ran them through the tests again, and the ones that had the cartilage on board did better in every single area, including cognition, felt more vital, um, you know, and happy, and their balance was better, and... Well, ta-da!